Hello folks and welcome back to English 403, 503, Digital Rhetoric, Discourse and Culture with me, Dr. Uh, Matt Barton. And uh, today's lecture is one of my favorite topics. It's a really cool idea. And I know you've watched this little video here. Uh, this is just the tip of the iceberg, McGonagall. Uh, well, I'll, you know, I'll tell you more about her as we go along here. But she's written several books. She's kind of, a, uh, I guess, a big deal uh, in this world of gamification. So the big picture here is... I always uh, think about it this way. You don't, you don't really have to coax uh, kids to want to play video games uh, the way that you might have to coax them to do their chores or to study. <laughs> or to, uh, you know, Maybe they care more about beating a video game than they do about making uh, an A in a classroom. Uh, so that's part of this. Another part is uh, with people going to work. You know, a lot of people, they do their, their job. They don't really uh, like their job. <laughs> they like their paycheck. Uh, you know, it could always be more, right? But it's just they don't really feel like their jobs are satisfying. You know, it doesn't really feel uh, fulfilling uh, doing their, their job. Uh, they get more satisfaction out of playing a video game. And she talks in this video about one called Farmville. Uh, that you may remember, it's kind of dated an example now, but you could probably think of uh, more modern games where, yeah, you feel like uh, even though it's just a game, uh, I like to play one called uh, 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 Sundew Valley, <laughs> Stardew Valley. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Where's my brain? Uh, it's kind of like Farmville. Uh, but yeah, you play that game and it's almost like you're doing chores on the farm. And somehow it makes you feel a little bit better. <laughs> you know, you feel like you've been productive. Or the same thing uh, with games like World of Warcraft. They have all these, or any kind of game where you have lots of quests. Uh, most modern games that come out, you have all these sort of side quests and all these different things you can do to feel sort of productive in the game. Uh, so that's, you're basically, if you think about like World of Warcraft, uh, or one of these games where you're kind of doing this repetitive task over and over again, maybe you have to kill 50 boars. 50 pigs are <laughs> uh, and then you get a little bit of experience points or you get, you get the quest satisfied so you can tick that box move on to the next thing you know that's kind of like work you know nobody would really say this i'm having so much fun you know killing the 50th boar <laughs> uh, so you know so what's up with that why do people uh, not only uh, not mind that but actually pay they pay to do that work right uh, whereas if it was something equally sort of tedious at a job site uh, where they're being paid to do it, you know, maybe in real life uh, you're feeding pigs or whatever. Uh, suddenly it doesn't seem like fun anymore, right? It just seems like uh, work. So McGonagall, I think her brilliance really is, is saying, you know, can we uh, change up work and school? Is, is there some way we can change those things uh, to make, to bring in, you know, whatever it is that makes games fun and addictive and compelling uh, to people, uh, can we adapt some of that so we can make workers more productive at the job or, uh, you know, kids more productive in school or, or even in college, you know? Uh, how can we make college students uh, enjoy their classes more, get more out of them, uh, be able to apply uh, the lessons that the professors are teaching in a, in a more concrete fashion? So there's a lot of stuff to unpack uh, with this. Let's just take a quick gander at some of the stuff McGonagall herself has done. Uh, this is probably her her best known book. I read this one, oh, I guess it's 2011. A little, I guess it's 10 years old now. Wow. <laughs> but uh, Why Games Make Us Better and How They Can Change the World. This is a really good book. You know, you can see it's a New York Times bestseller, so that's a pretty good indication. It's, it's actually readable. You know, this is one of those, I like to call them airport books. You know, if you got a long flight, you're looking for something to read, you go into the airport bookstore, pick this up, and you can actually uh, entertain yourself with this as well as get some educational value out of it. She's a good writer. Uh, but in here, she talks about some of the stuff we've been talking about. Uh, yeah, here she is talking about the World of Warcraft. And she talks about these games using the term uh, blissful productivity which is an interesting concept. So the idea there is, again, when you're playing uh, any of these games, whether it's World of Warcraft or what else does you have? Your Halo 3, uh, <laughs> games where you like collecting coins and things. Uh, it does feel a little bit like work, but somehow it feels more satisfying because you 
Uh, you can actually see almost immediately the benefit uh, of doing that work in these games and ticking off those boxes. Uh, with World of Warcraft, for example, every time basically you do anything, <laughs> you get rewarded somehow. Uh, it could be some just some experience points. Uh, it could be uh, uh, some gold coins you, know, you can use to buy stuff with. Uh, and the brilliance of these games, uh, games like WoW, too, is that every now and then you'll get the super-duper reward. <laughs> uh, so you might get just a common treasure, you know, for killing a, a boar. But you, know, you never know. There's always a chance uh, that that next boar that you kill uh, is going to give you, like, this epic item. It's just going to drop out of nowhere. <laughs> You'd be like, wow, you know. Uh, so once you have that happen to you, it's kind of like gambling with you know, a lot of this is kind of uh, based on or similar to just gambling at a casino. You know, why do people keep playing those uh, slot machines, video poker, even though they're losing a lot of money? Uh, well, it's because that thrill of that win, you know, compensates. It's better. You know, I guess you could say that's more powerful uh, than the little bit of pain from, you know, losing again and, and again. You know, you, you're kind of hoping that that next big win is right around the corner. Uh, same concept with some of these games. Uh, so that's some of the things she talks about in here. Uh, another thing, all the variety of stuff you can do in these games. There's so many different ways you can progress. You know, if you think about like the Red Dead Redemption series or the Grand Theft Auto, uh, uh, even Halo. I mean, just about all these games. Uh, if you don't play games, you might think, well, it's just guys running around. Uh, First of all, that's not even accurate, right? There's a lot more diversity than that. But, <laughs> but anyway, uh, you think it's just a bunch of people shooting each other. Uh, you, you're missing out on all these different sort of side quests and, and ways you can progress your characters and get better items. and uh, Not to say improve your skill. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that these games have of making themselves more playable so that you want to come back and play it again and again. All right, so that's games, but, you know, what does that have to, how can you really adapt any of this stuff for, you know, things beyond gaming? Well, one of the things that McGonagall herself has done, and her story, I don't know if she gets into this in the video, I don't remember, but she had an accident, and she had, I think, some kind of a, a brain, um, you know, brain issues, and she couldn't write anymore, and the doctors were saying that, you know, really the problem here is your mood. You know, basically depression, I guess, some form of depression. You know, these sort of negative, very negative thoughts uh, that are inhibiting you uh, from doing your, your writing. So she uh, liked to play games, you know, she talked about in the video. So she's trying to find ways, like, what can I do? Is there some way gaming, uh, I, I can use games to sort of boost my mood, make me more productive, help me get over this um, uh this sort of writer's block, I guess. <laughs> and uh, apparently she was very successful with this. Uh, she did this app called Super Better. You can see uh, everyone has heroic potential. Super Better builds resilience. It's kind of fun, isn't it? Super Better. Uh, the ability to play strong, motivated, and optimistic, even in the face of change and difficult challenges. Super Better unlocks heroic potential to overcome tough situations and achieve goals that matter most. You know, what's cool about this is that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's backed by science. You know, you've, I kind of got get on this soapbox a lot. You know, there's so much about schooling. You know, I, as a professor, you, you learn these things. There's all this sort of stuff that's passed off as like common sense uh, that you should be doing in your classroom. Like the one that I always think about is the learning styles. You hear about this all the time. Well, the, you know, every student has a totally different way that they learn. And, you know, there's uh, some of them are you know, auditory learners and some are visual learners and so on and so forth. You know, so that was taught to me. It's just like this is just how it is. You know, you, you think there must be there must be some science. <laughs> this must be based on evidence. Right. You know, kind of find out it's just complete hokum. Just you know, people just made that up. Whole learning styles thing. Uh, has nothing to do, actually the science that has been done on it shows it's false. <laughs> so not only does this, it's not based on science, the science actually says this is wrong. <laughs> That's just one example, but I mean just about everything. Uh, there's just a lot of catching up to do, which is why I try to stay active in this. Uh, I try to stay up on the brain science, especially the learning 
uh, you know, the actual learning science where they're studying the brain and, and doing, uh, you know, serious studies to try to find these things out. I'll give you another one. <laughs> another one. You know, a lot of students and teachers think that highlighting uh, helps you to retain information. So they'll, you know, they always give their kids highlighters and like just highlight all the important passages uh, and that will help you to remember. You know, and again, doesn't work. Actually counterproductive. You're better off without a highlighter. <laughs> And I'll give you one that uh, kind of surprises me is the idea of uh, rereading. Uh, so, we, you know, I grew up, again, I was taught this as a student, and I actually told this to uh, my students. You know, you shouldn't read an article or you shouldn't read something just once. You know, you should, you should read it several times, you know, especially right before the test. You know, you want to reread everything. Uh, and again, that sounds bizarre. Who knows why? But apparently uh, th that rereading uh, something actually makes it worse. Uh, so you do worse on the test than you would have if you had a, you know, just done the original reading. But anyway, uh, there's lots of those things. That's why it's so fascinating, frankly. Uh, just the stuff we think is common sense so often is not backed up by science. Uh, okay, so this is uh, apparently is backed up by science. And uh, again, I know some of this is true from the uh, some of the courses I've done about... Uh, you know, the brain research and learning. Uh, this idea of challenging yourself, constantly testing yourself, quizzing yourself, that is shown to be highly effective, probably uh, uh, more effective than anything. I don't know if she's got it in here. Let's see what else she... Let me just read through hers, and then we'll talk about it. So challenging yourself, collect and activate a power-up, find and battle the bad guys, seek out and complete a quest, recruit allies, adopt a secret identity, and go for an epic win. And she got a link there where you can learn more about the science. But you know, I just happened <laughs> to not know all this works uh, from some of my other research. So, like this, uh, for example, the uh, uh, like the secret identity. Uh, this is important because uh, a lot of you know. And another person that read about this is James Paul G. Uh, but he talks about how a lot of times when students come into a class, even like a science class, is what G talks about. Uh, the students in there are kind of made to feel like they don't know anything. You know, they're kind of disempowered, like, well, you're just, you know, you're just a complete novice. Uh, you just need to be quiet and listen to me and just try to memorize everything I'm saying. Uh, so they're not given a very powerful uh, position. You know, they don't feel too good, I guess, about their role. They kind of feel like, oh, I'll never get this. This is way over my head, uh, etc. And so what G talks about is... Uh, and McGonagall, too, is like, let's just get rid of that, you know, mindset. Let's just, uh, you know, let the kids role play. So you say, okay, well, for this activity, you will be the famous scientist, you know, Dr. Xavier or whatever. Uh, so you get to kind of create this uh, sort of glamorous persona for yourself. And somehow or another, that kind of boosts your confidence and you're able to, uh, you know, again, it sounds weird, right? <laughs> that something like this can make a difference, but... You know, this, again, the science backs it up. It does uh, help you or, or help these students. And like the recruiting allies, again, the social collaborative aspect of learning, huge. Uh, people don't realize that. They think you should just be all by yourself in a, in a nook <laughs> with a book. <laughs> uh, whereas, uh, you know, we, you learn better if you're learning uh, as, as part of a team or a group. Yeah, and the seeking out and completing quests, having a variety of activities to do, not just the same old grind, mixing it up, you know, so you don't just get stuck. But anyway, that's one of her products, Super Better. And she also did a book about this. Yeah, here's, here it talks about how she, uh, uh, she suffered a se severe concussion, unable to think clearly or work or even get out of bed, she became anxious and depressed, even suicidal. But rather than let herself sink further, she decided to get better by doing what she does best. She turned her recovery process into a resilience-building game. Uh, so you can read all about this in this uh, book. I haven't read this one. Super Better, The Power of Living Gamefully. I think I'll go ahead and order this, though. Uh, but I'll, I'll give you another example of this. People have applied her theory. This is one that gets talked about a lot. I've heard Mike Dando, <laughs> Professor Dando, <laughs> uh, uses this with his kids. Uh, so to get the kids to do chores, uh, you can 
give them this game sure wars and then you can finally you can claim experience points for housework and you know i've taught this class a few times as you can imagine and i get uh, sometimes parents students you know there's they've got two or three kids and they've told me uh, more than once just that they've used this chore worse and i hadn't really ever really heard about it but apparently, apparently it actually works quite well and you know, they're having a good uh you know good experience with this so you might want to check this out uh, but i think part of the appeal of this you know it's kind of boring for a kid you know go mow the grass or you know go pick up some uh, pick up the toys or whatever uh, but if you can kind of spin it into a narrative and have a you know, a villain in there, and, and you, you know, basically a little creativity uh, with some characters and kind of a story uh, that they're playing out, again, assuming a heroic role. You know, that's kind of fun to be uh, thinking of yourself as a champion or a hero uh, rather than just a, a bad kid <laughs> to go, go pick up their toys, right? Uh, so a lot of this stuff is getting incorporated in that. And then just another example, and I think this is why you see, I'm always saying, we, we're kind of behind the, the ball a little bit. We need to, uh, behind the curve a little bit here in college, we need to uh, you know, be a little bit more creative, a little bit more innovative. But, you know, this is what we've got. <laughs> so they want to gamify. This is called gamification, by the way, trying to make it more, more something that's not a game, more like a game, gamify it. Uh, so one of the things that always gets brought up is this badges concept so the you know how in the the scouts you have the uh, what is this thing the, the sash uh, i forget what that's called uh oh, i just can't think of words today but you know there's like little uh, badges or uh like patches you can get for doing certain things kind of going beyond uh you know doing something remarkable doing it well getting uh, tested on it i guess in some way you know, like prove you can do this thing you know maybe you learn how to tie a whole bunch of different kinds of knots uh, for example or you learn how to sail a boat you know just making stuff up but you get the idea so that's kind of tangible because now that you can you can test out and then you can get the uh, the badge to go on your uh, your uh, <laughs> what is that thing called <laughs> uh, anyway you know what i'm talking about uh, and so apparently this you know works out really well for the scouts it's actually how they make most of their money is my understanding because you have to pay uh the scouts for your kids you know, these badges cost money it's apparently how they are quite lucrative i suppose uh, so the people the, the good people at d2l bright space said you know we can do this virtually you know we, we can have uh, badges uh, so what happens here you within d2l you can say okay you know if uh if you make a a on the paper or if you uh sometimes you can make it more uh, random so maybe if you say if you have six sources in your paper instead of just the three you'll get a badge or if you do this extracurricular thing you'll get a badge uh, so the concept for me this is the, p the pure concept is this doesn't actually affect your grade directly you know to me it's it, that's you get in like intrinsic and extrinsic rewards you know if, if you're just doing something for bonus points uh, that to me is not the same as if you're doing it trying to earn one of these badges you know this should be uh kind of ranting a little bit here but if you think about steam or xbox how they have those achievements you know the you, you don't the people that like to earn those achievements it, it seldom has anything to do with you know make you know you get an achievement in world of warcraft that does not make your character more powerful you know it probably doesn't give you anything tangible that you can use in the game it just kind of gives you bragging rights. And so you can set yourself apart from all the other players. <clears throat> and you can sort of brag. You say, look, at I earned this achievement. You can look at other people's achievements. And some of them are quite difficult to earn. So it kind of gives you some ethos in those uh, with those games. If you earn a lot of the more difficult, uh, rare achievements. And some people play the game just for that. They don't even care anymore about the character levels and, you know, the fancy gear. <laughs> You know, they just want to have uh, all these achievements done. So, you know, there is something to say for this. You know, you can see how they're saying it. Well, if you do four assignments in a row completed on time, you get this little badge. I don't think these badges are very, uh, you know, like with the Steam, the badges are related to a certain game and they kind of have a theme. So it kind of looks cool when you're looking at your badges. <laughs> you know, these are kind of, uh, I mean, 
a number six. God. Oh, wow. You know, that, that's going to really make somebody's day. <laughs> you know, get put a little art into this. Uh, uh, anyway. Uh, uh. So I think that's about all I wanted to, uh, to say about this. But it's, it's always worth thinking about, you know, when you're thinking about maybe your own, if you, if you want to be a teacher or you want to present something, or if you want to give a presentation, uh, you know, maybe there's a way to gamify it somehow. You know, work in some of these concepts that work well in games. Uh, you know, a good example, I think, is the Twine program that we've been working with. You know, you could easily use that to make a something that could be relatively boring, uh, but you could use that tool to kind of put a story around it, put some characters in, make some interesting choices, uh, put the student into an interesting role uh, to play as a character, and you might make a, a really fun uh, gamifying experience and again, part of this work that she's been doing here is saying that that fun factor is not just a frivolous thing or it's, you know, people say, well, it's, it's work. It's not supposed to be fun, you know, you know that sort of thing. And she's, she's saying don't have that attitude because if, if people are enjoying the work, if they're having fun at their job, you know, if they're trying to earn these achievements or whatever the case may be, uh, you'll actually, they'll actually get more work done. You know, so that, that's better for everybody. You know, people are really uh, happy to go to work and, you know, eager to get to it. Uh, so anyway, I'll stop it there. Hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you next time.